بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so today we will continue our series on Abu Bakr al-Siddiq رضي الله تعالى عنه and in our last lesson we had finished the main achievements of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in the Madani phase and so today we will actually begin with the beginning of his Khilafah. I had already talked about the incident of the Saqifa of Banu Sa'idah, so we're not going to repeat that, how he was elected. All of this was discussed in the uh, Seerah. Now, there's one episode we're going to begin with, one incident that in fact overlaps the end of the Seerah and the beginning of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And most scholars of Seerah discuss this incident in the Seerah. I did not discuss it because I knew I would discuss it now. And that is the army of Usama ibn Zayd. Okay? This is one of the last commandments of the Prophet wasallam. And if you go back to my seerah, uh, you will see that I really did not discuss this. I just referenced it briefly and then I moved on. I did not discuss the whole episode in detail. Why? Because the, the goal was to discuss it when we talk about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And that is what we are doing uh, right now. And so what is this incident of the army of Usama uh, ibn Zayd. So two and a half days before the Prophet ﷺ passed away, so we now go back to the seerah, because this is an incident that spans the end and the beginning. The end of the seerah, the beginning of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And while the Prophet ﷺ was in bed, sick with fever, one of the final commandments that he gave was to send an expedition to fight once again in the direction of Tabuk and beyond, which is the Roman Empire. And he appointed Usama ibn Zayd. And Usama ibn Zayd uh, is the son of uh, Zayd ibn Haritha, who is the who was the adopted son, and then Allah prohibited adoption. So that is Zayd ibn Haritha. His mother was Umm Ayman, and who is Umm Ayman? Khadija slave. The wife of Zayd, very good, yes. She's the wife of Zayd, obviously, because their son is Usama. <laughs> Who is Umm Ayman? The, she is the... No, not foster mother. No, 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 that is Halima. When he got married? That is, that is Zayd. You're getting confused with Zayd. Umm Ayman is Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib's gift to Amina. Umm Ayman goes back one generation. Umm Ayman, after the death of Abdullah, she became the, not the foster mother, but the caretaker of the Prophet wasallam, And she was the one who, when Amina died, she was the one who brought the process and back to Mecca. Okay, so she was with Amina when Amina died. Okay, so we're getting there. Ilsbir Sabar and Jamila. Okay, so uh, Umm Ayman is of a different generation. Now, we do not know, uh, and she was um, Habashia, we do not know any details about when exactly she was born. Uh, and she most likely died in the Khilafah of Abu Bakr uh, al-Siddiq. Some say she lasted until uh, the beginning of Uthman, but she does not really have any major role uh, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, Umm Ayman uh, married Ubaid ibn al-Hadith uh, al-Khazraji, uh, and the two of them had Ayman. And that's why she's called Umm Ayman. And Ayman uh, died a shaheed, uh, in the battle of Hunayn. He participated with the process in the battle of Hunayn and he died a shaheed. So Ayman uh, dies a shaheed. Uh, her husband as well passed away a natural death. And, and this is many, many years ago. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married Umm Ayman to Zayd. Now, clearly there's a huge age gap between the two. We do not know how many, but at least two decades. At least two decades. That Zayd was younger than Umm Ayman by at least two decades, if not more. And most likely, uh, she would have been 
right at the end of her childbearing years when she delivered Usama, Usama right? Maybe late 40s, maybe even early 50s. Because that's the only way to reconcile. If you look at all of the ages and whatnot, uh, this is the only way to reconcile that she must have been at the very end of the possibility of her childbearing years. And uh, therefore, uh, Ayman, uh, sorry, um, Usama, uh, his mother is Ummi Ayman, his father is Zaid. And the both of them are very beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore, Usama is being born to a household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Both of these members are members of his household. And he was literally born in the house of Khadija. Literally, Usama was born in the house of Khadija. And he was known as Hibbu Rasulillah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is his nickname or his title. Hibbu Rasulillah. The one whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved. And Usama was probably 18, some say 20 years old when this appointment was done. He is a very young man. I mean, 18 and 20, you're just basically reaching manhood. Now, when he was appointed uh, to lead the army, automatically uh, talk began amongst the people. And they said, how could he appoint, uh, not, not how could he appoint, but why, not how, but why. Why is he appointing Usama when he is so young, when we are older, when the Muhajirun have senior uh, commanders, when some of our sons are older than him? Some of our sons are older than him, and now we have to go behind him as a, as a leader. And when the rumors reach back the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so, and he's, uh, of course, the, the, the death occurs on what day? Monday morning, after Fajr, before Dhuhr. Monday early morning. T- uh, sorry, Saturday Saturday afternoon, he walks into the masjid, car- carried, and he has a turban tightly wrapped around his head to make the pain less, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he sits on the mimbar, and one of the final commandments that he gives is regards to the expedition of Usama. And he says, he says to uh, the Sahaba that if you are talking against his appointing to be a leader, then verily you also spoke against his father being appointed leader. In other words, this is not the first time you're criticizing this family. When I appointed his father to be a leader, you also spoke against that. And wallahi, he was worthy, meaning the father, Zaid, was worthy of being a leader. And wallahi, he was worthy of being a leader. And he, meaning Zaid, was of the most beloved of all people to me. And now him, and he pointed to Usama, is of the most beloved of mankind to me. Okay, now the reference here is to Zaid having been appointed in the battle of Mu'ta. In the battle of Mu'ta, Zaid was appointed commander. And some of the munafiqun, none of the senior sahaba, some of the munafiqun said that he has appointed a mawla over us. And so they denigrated his race because uh, Zaid was not, he was a mawla. Okay, so he was not of the, uh, the, the pure, if you like, Qurashis and whatnot. So he's appointed somebody who's a lowly class, he used to be a slave, now he's been freed. So this is a mawla class, they call them, right? So they is appointed, so the munafiqun, they criticized uh, Zaid's heritage. And of course, this is racism and jahiliyyah. And the Prophet Sallallahu of course, was hurt at that point. And, the, and now he brings up that and he goes, you criticized his father, you meaning the people, not anybody in particular. And now you're criticizing the son, and verily, basically, I love the uh, both of them. And uh, this also uh, shows us as well that no doubt being of age is a good characteristic to gain the respect of the people. And it is the general rule that you need to be somebody of a healthy age to become a leader. Generally speaking, society will not respect you if you are 19, 20, 21, and you want to take on leadership positions because wisdom and learning comes from life experiences. But there are always exceptions. And there could be exceptions. Our Prophet was an exception. That he took on leadership positions. We talked about the incidents in Mecca. Here we have Usama ibn Zayd is an exception. So in every society and place, there's always some exceptions. And 
it is sunnah as well to look at those exceptions and make them, put them into ranks and privilege. And it is healthy to have some young voices as well, as we always say in our society as well. Every, every community knows this, even though not everybody acts upon it, that there is always healthy to bring in some intelligent up and coming young voices because that brings another perspective. So our Prophet ﷺ recognized in Usama ibn Zayd leadership and he chose him to be the leader above and beyond many of the senior companions. On Sunday morning, so this is Saturday night, on Sunday morning, Usama comes to the house of the Prophet to bid farewell before departing. And at that time again, there was no notion that the Prophet would pass away. Still everybody, the, the thought of him going away didn't come to them. So still everybody thinks it's just a bad fever, he'll overcome it. So Usama came to the house of Aisha to bid farewell to the Prophet ﷺ. He is already at a stage where he cannot speak. The fever is so bad, he cannot speak. And so he opens his eyes, he sees Usama, and all he can do is lift his finger upwards and then point it to the chest of Usama. And this means, it's a dua, may Allah be with you, right? It's a dua that Allah will be with you. Okay, so Usama understood that he's making dua, he's telling him Allah will be with him. And uh, Sunday, Usama exited the city of Medina, left with the army, and they got to the outskirts of uh, Medina and they camped. Because, you know, taking the army out, it takes a while. They probably would have left Sunday afternoon. They're going to march a little bit just to get the organization. It's going to take an, a few hours. They camp right outside Medina at a place called Jurf. And the next morning is Monday. And of course, Monday is the day. And so, uh, Umm Ayman sends a messenger uh, Monday morning. She sends a messenger to her son, Usama, that do not go, come back to the city. The process has passed away. So Tuesday morning, Usama gets the message when the army is literally just about, they've left the city. And they're just outside basically, camped the night. It must have taken a few hours to organize. You know how it goes, regiments, this and that. However, whatever needs to be done, that would have taken all of basically Sunday. So they decide to camp right outside Medina, three, four, five miles away. Uh, now where they camped is of course a part of the modern city. But in those days it was outside the city. And then the next morning the message comes, come back to the city. So uh, Osama and the entire army comes back on Monday. The entire army comes back on Monday. And of course on Monday the Saqifa incident takes place. Late afternoon. Okay. So Late afternoon, the Saqif incident already takes place, and the same evening on Monday, the same evening, perhaps after Maghrib, maybe at Isha, but perhaps after Maghrib, Abu Bakr Siddiq announces, now he is the Khalifa, and he announces that all of you in the army of Usama will not spend the night in Medina. Go back. Go back to the area is called Jurf, where you had your tents, go back there right now. And so the first decision literally that Abu Bakr made was the decision to not even allow the army to spend the night in Medina. Because subhanAllah, even psychologically, the army is ready to go, they're ready. Now they've already come back. Imagine if they spend the night there. Are they going to be ready now to go again? Of course not. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq says, every one of you that was in the army is going to go back to the army right now. And so they have to obey. They camp at the army at Jurf, but the next morning Usama basically sends a message that O oh, Khalifa to Rasulullah, and of course I didn't mention this before, I'll mention it now, that the title of Abu Bakr throughout his entire life was Khalifa to Rasulullah. This was the title that he took, Khalifa to Rasulullah, the one who has taken over after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then when Umar ibn Khattab became the Khalifa, they said Khalifa to Khalifati Rasulullah. You are the one who took over from the one who took over from the Prophet Sallallahu And Umar ibn Khattab said, if we're going to start this trend, the Khalifa is going to get very, very long, right? Khalifa to Khalifati, Khalifati, and then go on and on. So he goes, why don't you just call me the leader of the believers, Amir al-Mu'mineen. And so that was why the title Amir al-Mu'mineen came after. But Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was always called Khalifa to Rasulullah. So Usama said that, Ya Khalifa to Rasulullah, O uh, uh, the one who is in charge after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I feel uneasy about leaving Medina and you are new now, you don't, we don't know what's going to happen uh, and uh, it is not the right time, perhaps we should think things through basically. So he's sending some negotiation. And it's not just Usama. Many of the other Sahaba felt very uneasy 
about the army of Usama leaving because in it were the majority of the Muhajirun, were the fighting of the Ansar. This is an army that was sent to Syria, that was going to go to Bilad al-Sham, to the Romans. It's not a small army. It was going to be an army that is basically composed of the best men, their resources, their armor, their weapons. All of this is going to go up. And so the next day, the discussion began amongst the Sahaba and there was a meeting in the masjid led by Umar ibn al-Khattab and Usama ibn Zayd's representative uh, that they were arguing the fact that it is not appropriate to send an army out right now. And Umar said that uh, I have with us, we have with us the noblest of the Muslims, their primary batch. And I do not feel safe that Medina will be safely protected against the munafiqun and against the mushrikun who have just converted, the new Muslims. Because remember, the 8th and ninth year, and especially the 10th year, was Am al-Wufud, when all of these delegates came from across Arabia, and Iman has not yet entered their hearts, they're political converts. And we're going to see this next, Tuesday, next Wednesday, inshallah, when we talk about the, the wars of Ridda, when the wars of Ridda, which is one of the... Uh, biggest uh, and most important incidents in the, in the Khilaf of Abu, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is the incident of Ridda and that's exactly what did happen. Umar's fear of people leaving Islam came true but his fear of Medina being harmed did not come true. So Umar ibn Khattab said, I'm worried about these new converts, the mushrikun that have just converted. And they continue to persist convincing Abu Bakr al-Siddiq not to send the army. And this was the position of the overwhelming majority of the Sahaba. In fact, the books of Sirah do not mention it is as if Abu Bakr had no support in this. And Allah knows most. maybe he had some voices, but definitely the majority of voices did not uh, support this issue. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said to give him some time to think about this and to come back the next day and they will have another meeting. And the next day, the next day, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq basically acted in his conscience, his conscience would not allow him to undo something the Prophet ﷺ had done, to untie something the Prophet ﷺ had tied. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, we know his Iman, we know how much uh, faithful he was to the commands of the Prophet ﷺ, and he could not rationalize, he didn't want to think double guess. Whatever the Prophet ﷺ said, you must do it, and that is the safety. For Abu Bakr's Iman, that is the way forward, and that is in fact what saved Islam, that Iman of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And so he decided to go against all of that counsel. And he gave a very emotional, a very powerful speech, and of what he said, and it's a, a speech that has been recorded in, in the books of history, of what he said is that, I swear by the one in whose hands is the soul of Abu Bakr, if I were certain that beasts of prey would attack Medina and tear me bit by bit, I would still not keep the Jaysh of Usama, the army of Usama with me in Medina. And if I were the last person left in Medina, I would be the one who goes forth to fight against the Romans. So he's basically acting like a leader and telling them that I believe passionately in this cause. And if I were the only one that's going to do it, then I'm going to be the one that does it. And he roused up the Iman of the Sahaba and so when the Sahaba realized he's not going to budge, so when he go, went back into his house, they sent Umar ibn al-Khattab to him, and they said, at least convince him to change the Amir, to change the army leader, right? Usama is still young, and they need to get an experienced commander. And so Umar ibn al-Khattab went to the house of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and said to him that, at least choose a commander who is older than Usama. Find somebody who's a little bit, you know, he's only 19, for example. They think about it like he's not going to be respected, he's not experienced enough. And at this, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu became so angry, he jumped up and he held on to the beard of Umar ibn Khattab. And he said, the Prophet ﷺ appointed him in that manner, the way that he said, and you want me to take him away? In other words, you of all people, Ya Umar ibn Khattab, you think that I would go against that emotional Saturday event, right? When he is explicitly putting Usama in charge, right? So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq became angry at the suggestion that how dare you think I will go against what uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us to do. And so Umar came out very angry at the people who sent him in and said, look what trouble you got me into. You guys sent me in, now look at the trouble that I am in. Now here I have to point out something and that is 
the Islamic concept of shura is the topic of a lot of discussion and it doesn't need to be the topic of a lot of discussion. This is an in interesting incident where it appears that Abu Bakr ignored the entire shura and he simply went against the entire shura. And this is used by lots of people, especially when they're in charge of the shuras against them, for example. Like, I don't care what anybody says, this is the sunnah to follow. And this is incorrect to extrapolate from this. Because, to put it very simply, the rules of the shura can vary from society and time and place and circumstance and condition. And in this version of the shura that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq enacted, it was not a formal shura with constitutional rights, with a voting procedure. It was an informal matter that they are giving him their suggestion and it, he, he didn't agree to it. Now, this does not mean that any other shura in the world or any other parliament or any other democracy or any other Islamic country has to follow this version of government. There's nothing wrong with having a different version of government, call it an elected parliament, where the president has a certain power but not the unlimited, whatever it might be. There's nothing wrong Islamically with formulating a modern system of government. And the fact that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq had it one way does not necessarily mean that is the only legitimate way. It was a way that, is, that was acceptable and is still Islamically acceptable. And I've said this many times, Islamic political science is not set in stone. The theory of governance is vast enough to encompass khilafas and dynasties. You have kingdoms, you have monarchs, you have, it's all, it's all Islamic law is dynamic enough to allow for all of this change. And we thank Allah because if it didn't allow this much change, we wouldn't have had the power and the izzah and the variety of leaders that we've had for the last 14 centuries. That Allah Azza wa Jal incorporated into the Sharia the elasticity. That you can have it this way, you can have it that way. So the point is that this incident cannot be used to make a general rule for all democracies or Islamic governments or whatever. No, there are, uh, if you like, uh, there's permission to do other things as well. So uh, when this was decided, khalas, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is adamant and he is the Khalifa. And so uh, that is going to happen. And so the next day, uh, the command was given for the army to depart. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq himself, he walked out to lead the army towards Syria. So he walked uh, to Jurf and from Jurf he led the army just like, you know, the first few steps to go, to give them advice, to give them encouragement. And when Usama saw him, and Usama was on his horse, and Abu Bakr was walking, he said that, Ya Khalifa to Rasulullah, Wallahi, either you will ride, or I will come down. I cannot speak to you like this. I am, I am the one on the, on, the, on the horse, and you are uh, walking. Wallahi, either you will get on a or, horse, and at least we can talk, or I will come down. So Usama, you can see his modesty, you can see his humility. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, Wallahi, neither will you get down, nor will I ride on a horse. Rather, what is wrong if I get my feet dirty and dusty in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? Why can't I do this? Let my feet get dusty while I'm walking in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, he asked permission from Usama, Abu Bakr the Khalifa. He asks permission from Usama that Umar ibn al-Khattab had been assigned by the Prophet to the army. Uh, can I at least take him uh, with me because I need him now. So he's asking permission from Usama. And of course, of course, Usama gave him this permission that uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab could remain in Medina. And he gave that parting advice to Usama. And this advice, I think most of us have read it here and there. It is one of the most famous pieces of advice that is given in the rules of war. That Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and this is the first offensive jihad in the history of Islamic expansions after the Prophet's death. Okay, this is why it's so important. The first expansion of the Ummah will take place now. Because as we all know, Usama's expedition eventually, not immediately, leads to the conquest of Jerusalem. Slowly but surely, it's the first, it's the first uh, you know, um, uh, step in order to get to actual Quds. 
And what was the advice that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq gave? This is an advice that should be uh, set in stone. And you compare this advice, by the way, with some of these fanatical groups in our times, right? Compare this advice to what some of these groups are doing. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said that do not be treacherous. Khiyana. And do not steal from the booty. And do not break your promises. So it is not allowed to lie or to double stab. It's not allowed to, in our times we'll say, carry a passport and then use the passport to do something that is basically an act of war. That you lie when you get the passport, you lie when you get the visa. This is treason. This is treachery. It's not allowed to be a, a double standard here, double traitor here. This is not something permissible. So do not be treacherous. Do not steal booty. Do not break your promises. Do not mutilate dead bodies. Do not mutilate dead bodies. Do not cut off trees that are green, that are giving fruit. So don't just destroy property for no reason. Uh, do not kill an animal unless you're going to eat it. Even animal life is sacred. Do not kill an animal unless you're going to eat it. And then he said, and you will pass by peoples who have cut themselves off from others, worshipping. So leave them and their worship. Now, uh, the Arabs, the Jahili Arabs did not really have the concept of a monk or an ascetic person. This is something the Romans had. And the army of Usama is going into Roman territory. So they're going to come across people who are not warriors. They are people that are worshippers, ascetics, priests, monks. And so Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said, leave them alone in their worship. They're not involved in your wars. You don't have to do anything to them. And from this, the bulk of the modern ummah, the bulk of the modern ummah, the, the fuqaha of our scholars have basically said, this ruling is in essence the ruling of what we now call civilians. Because in medieval times, even a few hundred years ago, there was no such thing as civilians and a standing army. Every able-bodied man was the army. That was the way things worked. Whereas in modern times, you have clear-cut army and you have civilians. These are the people that are warriors. These are the people that are just going about their daily lives. And the Prophet ﷺ, or in this hadith, sorry, in this incident, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is explicitly saying, you're going to come across people, they have nothing to do with your warfare, let them be. And from this, as I said, the majority of scholars have extrapolated that the ruling on civilians is that they should not be uh, harmed intentionally and directly. Then he said that, and you will come across people who will give you all types of food. So say the name of Allah as you eat, meaning be conscious of Allah, be thankful of Allah as you eat. And you shall meet an army, and he described the army of the Romans. They had a certain hairstyle that they had. They would shave portions of their head and leave other portions. So he said, when you meet those people, attack them with your swords and ask the help of Allah against them. So remember dua, be firm, and fight against the army that will fight you, okay? This, uh, this beautiful advice of Bakr al-Siddiq shows us that the Muslim army is not allowed to mutilate, to steal, to be treacherous, to double cross, to, to, to intentionally lie. Uh, they're not allowed to even destroy uh, property or, or greenery or harm people that are not going to uh, affect them. And that even in war, uh, there are laws that are going to be applied. Now this incident of Usama, we're going to inshallah continue in a few weeks about the story of Usama. That's not Today's lesson, we're going to move on to some other things. This incident of Usama, it shows us many things. First and foremost, and most importantly for us, the eagerness of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq to follow the commands of the Prophet wasallam. That how much iman did he have? He would not disobey one thing coming from the Prophet wasallam. It also shows us the wisdom of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq that in sending Usama, a subconscious message was also sent to both the Romans and to the pagans. And that subconscious message was that the Muslims are so powerful that even at the death of their Prophet ﷺ, they can send a large army. And it is said that the news of the death of the Prophet ﷺ and the army of Usama, the news of both of these incidents, reached the emperor of Rome at the same time. And of course it would because they happened with a day apart. So he heard in the same message that the prophet of the Arabs has died and an army is attacking you. And this caused him and his entourage to remark, how can it be 
that their messenger has just died and yet they attack our lands. And this is psychological warfare. And it worked because that's the whole point that the, the, the bravery that Abu Bakr Siddiq displayed was in fact translated as bravery by the emperor of Rome. And the same went for the pagans of, Mac of uh, Arabia. That the message was given, the message was sent. The fact that they're sending an army now clearly means they must be heavily fortified in Medina. And so no army was sent against Medina. Psycholo again, there is no, as you all know, there's no CNN, there's no video camera. The news that there's an army leaving Medina, automatically one would think, well then they must have plenty of reinforcements or they wouldn't send an army to fight the Romans. So not a single army attacked Medina. Imagine that. Even though, hypothetically, theoretically, if the other tribes that were not really Muslim were to invade Medina, that's it, there's nothing. But the bravery of Abu Bakr and tawakkal ala Allah, the Prophet said it, we cannot disobey. And Allah will protect us. And that's exactly what happened. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. As well, the, uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq walking out to the army, walking with them. This is really a true leader. Giving them that strength, that moral strength. Walking while they're riding. How do you think they're going to feel? Giving them that beautiful advice, encouraging Usama, getting the permission from Usama. How will that make Usama feel? Even though he doesn't need permission, he's the Khalifa. But still, that permission makes Usama now understand the responsibility of being an Amir. All of this, the tarbiyah of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or sorry, as the Prophet sallam said, whoever humbles himself for the sake of Allah, Allah will raise him up. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is clearly humbling himself for the sake of Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave him that izzah and that rank and that honor. So this is the first incident we talked about today. And inshallah in a few weeks we'll continue about the army uh, of Usama and fighting against the Romans. The second incident uh, we have to just kind of somewhat gloss over, not go into the lengthy detail that so many groups have gone over uh, and it is something that I tried my best not to go, teach, go, go too deeply into but still some things need to be done uh, and this is one of them. And that is this issue or this understanding or this narrative that exists that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu did not give the oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq for an extended period of time. There is this narrative out there. Now I'm going to go over this in not that much detail, but inshallah in enough for us to, for just to understand it. As I already explained a few weeks ago, it's not my goal or desire to really, otherwise these issues, wallahi, with no exaggeration, you can have three, four, five lectures just on the controversies between the Sunni and the Shia in the time of Abu Bakr. And then another 50 lectures in the time of Ali and whatnot. We don't have time even, and, and it's not interest, it's not of our interest in our Iman, as I said, to go into that. Nonetheless, just to gloss over it once. Uh, and also before I begin this narrative, uh, from our perspective, we do have a version of events that's different from the other group. Okay, please keep this in mind. Any time uh, you hear that, oh, this happened, that happened, and you hear it from a source that is not our source, realize there are two narratives. There's two historical narratives. Now, those narratives agree on some key points. But both narratives disagree on many points. Is that clear? Right? Both narratives, and of course I mean the Sunni and the Shi'i narrative here, they agree on some key points, but they disagree or they have details. Each one has details the other does not have. And in the end of the day, for the beginning Muslim, you really must decide which of the two narratives you want to accept. Because the average Muslim is not qualified to go into the authenticity of the references here, the references there. Really, it's a theological issue where the average Muslim simply needs to make a judgment call. Do you really think there was so much hatred and animosity that was hidden amongst the great Sahaba for so many years? Or do you think, which is a Sunni narrative, that there was not that much, maybe there was some little bit here and there of human nature even between Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma, minor things happen. We just talked about that a few weeks ago, right? Uh, where uh, in the fadal of Abu Bakr that Umar ibn Khattab had an issue with him, right? But they reconciled. So what then if Abu Bakr and Ali radiallahu anhuma might have had a minor issue and then they reconciled? So to make that minor issue and make it so big, which is what is happening here, this is the problem. Maybe there was something very trivial, maybe, but so what? 
And the other thing as well is that from our, from our perspective, this whole dwelling on the past is unhealthy and unnecessary. And from the Shi'i perspective, frankly, that is what Shi'ism is primarily about. Frankly, I'm not, I'm not trying to be derogative here, I'm just trying to state a fact. That from their perspective, they feel the rights of the Al al-Bayt were uh, taken uh, unjustly and they must continue to bring up to this day. And one could respond, even if you feel this way, Allah will judge, not you. So you do what you can with your life. And to go back 13 and a half, 14 centuries and say he did this, she did this, they that, Allah will judge them. If you really feel this way, Allah will judge them. And to keep on living in those memories and they did this and he did this and this is deprived of that. What is to be gained now? It is really a question that needs to be asked. And of course, from our perspective, there's much to be lost and that is disrespecting the Sahaba. It is better to err on the side of caution and be quiet. Even if you feel a certain way, are you the judge? Obviously not. Allah is the judge. So let Allah judge. It's a past incident. Move on. But as we know, that's not the reality. And also, the fact of the matter, and I mentioned this in my Karbala lecture as well, you even see this in the knowledge of the Sunni and the knowledge of the Shi'i. The average Sunni really is not that knowledgeable about what happened in this time frame. Because his belief is not affected by it. Whereas the average Shi'i is very much aware of his version, not our version, of his version of what happened. Abu Bakr did this, Umar did this, Uthman did this, all of them have a long list, right? And when the average Sunni hears this, he's like, oh, I never heard this in my life. Because their religion and their narrative is not based upon these facts. Allah and His Messenger, the Quran and Sunnah, this is what Islam is based on. Historical incidents, no matter what happened, it's not going to change theology. Correct? It's not going to change belief in Allah and belief in the Messenger. It happened, whatever happened. But nonetheless, just to go over this in a, a quick manner, uh, from our perspective, from our perspective, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu, uh, definitely approved of and accepted the Khilafah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar ibn al-Khattab and Uthman ibn Affan. And he was an advisor to all three of them. And he occupied ministerial positions in all three of their Khilafahs. And this is a fact that even the Shia accept. They don't deny this fact. Now, what fact I mean is the ministerial positions, right? They say that he didn't agree or he didn't like their Khilafah. They disagree with this point. But they do not deny that he was a basically the equivalent of a minister, i.e. in every one of the Khilafahs he had a role to play. He was either a judge, he was a, uh, in the Shura, he was uh, sent to be a, a, a governor, and they don't deny this. And the mere fact that he was used by the three to be a primary player in the government clearly indicates what, from our perspective, that they got along. Now, did they have minor disagreements? Of course they did, but that's a part of being human. We talked about this many times. Even between Abu Bakr and Umar, they're raising their voices in front of the Prophet sometimes. They're having uh, arguments and then they reconcile. And we said in that humanity is our perfection, right? In that humanity is our perfection of our role models between the Sahaba. So from our perspective, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, he might have, it might have crossed his mind that maybe, uh, maybe I might be the Khalifa after the death of the Prophet There's nothing wrong with this. If somebody thinks this, but he accepted the Khilafah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. That is the key point here. And, and here's one of the points, whenever you talk about these things, you bring the books along and you open them up and this is the standard stuff, which I haven't done. But today I'm not doing it to like give you an aura of authenticity, but simply because uh, I didn't want to translate all of these long passages and just bring the Arabic. And it does help to know that these are authentic references. So from us, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, in the edition I have, it's uh, volume 7, uh, page 749, uh, hadith number 4,447. Uh, and this uh, is in the book of Maghazi, the book of Sirah of Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, the chapter regarding the death of the Prophet Sallallahu an interesting episode that uh, sheds some beautiful light for us to benefit from. Um, it is reported from Abdullah bin Abbas that Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, visited the Prophet Sallallahu in his deathbed sickness. 
in the sickness that he was about to pass away in. And when he came out, the people said to him, Ya Aba al-Hasan, that's his kunya, how is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, he has woken up in good spirits, alhamdulillah. In other words, he thinks he's going to be okay. As I said, everybody thought he would be okay. Okay. Then, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, and of course Abbas is his his uncle, Abbas ibn Abdul, took him by the hand, pulled him aside, and he said to him, Anta wallahi ba'da thalathatin abdul asa, uh, which is basically, he is saying, after three days, you shall not have a leader. Meaning, the Prophet will die within three days. And then he said, وَإِنِّي وَاللَّهِ لَأَرَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم سوف يتوفى من وجعه هذا. And I swear I am positive that the Prophet will pass away because of this sickness because إِنِّي لَأَعْرِفُ وُجُوهَ بَنِي عَبْدُ الْمُطَلِبِ عِنْدَ الْمَوْتِ I know the looks on the faces of the Banu Abdul Muttalib at the time of death. In other words, Abbas is much older and Abbas has seen so many of his own relatives die, including his father, including Abu Talib, including Abu Lahab. These are all, and he's seen them one after the other. And he, and this is, you know, subhanAllah, it's something that people are gifted with, some people, that you just, you, you know something. And Abbas said, I have seen, Abbas said, I have seen the look on his face. It is the look of death of the children of Banu Abdul Muttalib. And he is of the children of Banu Abdul Muttalib. And so, Abbas radiallahu anhu is saying to Ali radiallahu anhu, listen to this. اذهب بنا إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلنسأله في من هذا الأمر. Let us go to the Prophet sallam and ask him who shall this matter be given to. This hadith is in Bukhari and in Muslim. It's متفق عليه حديث. Okay. So Abbas radiallahu anhu, who is the older, the senior, age-wise, right? He's lived life longer because Ali radiallahu anhu is still. He's not young like Zaid, uh, sorry, Usama. He's not like 19, but he's not like Abu Bakr and Umar either, right? He is 30 years old right now. And 30 is not that young, but neither is it 60. And Abu Bakr was 60 at this time. Okay, there's a big difference between 30 and 60, as everyone in this audience knows. No matter what your age is, you all know the difference. So Abbas is now 60. And he is the one telling Ali radiallahu anhu, let's go and ask him, who does this matter belong to? In kana fina alimna dhalik. If it is amongst us, meaning who is us here? Al al Banu Hashim. If it is amongst us, the Banu Hashim, we shall know. And wa in kana fi ghayrina alimnahu fa awsabina. And if it is to other than us, then we shall also know this. And he shall give us our due or whatever is our wasiyah as well. He'll tell us what our role is as well. فَقَالَ Ali, Ali said, إِنَّا وَاللَّهِ لَإِنْ سَأَلْنَاهَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَمَنَعْنَاهَا لَا يُعْطِيْنَاهَا النَّاسُ بَعْدَهُ وَإِنِّي وَاللَّهِ لَا أَسْأَلُهَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ if I were to ask the Prophet Sallallahu and he were not to give this command to us, then the people will never give it to us either. In other words, if he's not going to give it to us now, then nobody's going to then afterwards are going to say, oh, the Prophet did not give it to you. And so by Allah, I will not ask him who this matter belongs to. Now, this shows us so many things. Firstly, that the idea crosses the minds of Abbas and Ali radiallahu anhuma, and so what? So be it. It is halal, it is natural. There's nothing wrong with this. Why wouldn't it cross their minds? Ali radiallahu anhu is after all the son-in-law. He is one of the closest. He has a long history of being in the forefront. And it is human nature to want to influence others in a positive manner. And this means to be in a position of leadership. Who amongst us Inshallah, with the best of intentions, does not want to help other people, right? So we have no problems at all affirming that Ali radiallahu anhu had this, maybe I will be in charge. But he has also the foresight to see, look, if we, I asked him, he said, no, it's not for you. Then I'm never going to get it. And it's best to leave it be. Let the people 
it, it's, I don't want to ask him explicitly. And so Ali radiallahu anhu did not go and ask him. This also shows therefore that they might have again been thinking about it, but they're not, it's not what's consuming them, which is what the other group says. It's not the most important thing to them. It's not as if this is, oh my God, who's, it, it's just, it passes, it's a conversation, life goes on, right? That's our philosophy. That's what we understand of Ali ibn Abi Talib and of others. That So what if he thought of it? How is that going to be harmful to his character? But to claim that he was obsessive about it, that this was his main, this is actually insulting to him. Wallahi, it's insulting to him. That's from our perspective, you know, what they say. This was not the most important thing on his mind. And it should not be. But did it cross his mind? Yes, it did. Why wouldn't it? And it's human being to cross them. But then he said, let it be. I don't want, you know, if it doesn't happen, doesn't happen. Also notice, very explicitly, Abbas radiallahu anhu says, if it's for other than us, then we'll know it. He is not astaghfirullah thinking to disobey the Prophet sallallahu to, to want to be the ones in charge. He's accepting. That's the really interesting point here. That look, if it's for us, alhamdulillah. If it's not for us, alhamdulillah, we'll know. That's the attitude. And this is exactly the Sunni perception of Al-Abbas and Ali radiallahu anhu. Exactly what we have. That, yes, that was indeed the case. In any case, so this is now, this incident takes place when the Prophet is still alive. Okay, now, it is said that Ali radiallahu anhu did not give the oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq for six months until the death of Fatima. This is, I would say, a standard view of Sunni historians. And it is the standard view of Shi'i historians as well. The Shi'i historians have no other narrative. From their perspective, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was for, uh, forced Ali to give the bay'ah after the death of Fatima. This was forced. From our perspective, there's two opinions. Neither of them says forced. The first narrative, which I would say is very dominant, I'm not going to say the majority, but it's pretty common, is that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq uh, noticed that Ali radiallahu anhu did not give the bay'ah. And after six months, when Fatima radiallahu anha passed away, he then asked her to give the bay'ah, and he gave the bay'ah. Okay? This is one narrative. It is mainstream. There is another narrative as well. And that is that Ali radiallahu anhu did give the bay'ah initially. And when rumors began to spread that there might be issues, so Abu Bakr as-Siddiq asked him to give it again a second time after six months. And this is the opinion of the foremost historian of medieval Sunni Islam, and that is Ibn Kathir in his al Bidai wa Nihaya, that this is the opinion of Ibn Kathir. And uh, both opinions have some evidence. As for the uh, position that Ali radiallahu anhu gave the bay'ah right when the Prophet passed away, and he gave it again after six months. This is based on a narration in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim. The Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, by the way, uh, is a very famous book. Um, Al-Hakim died 405 Hijra. And uh, this book was meant to, Al-Mustadrak means the additions. Ala sahihain the, the, the book is called Al-Mustadrak Ala sahihain The additions to the two authentic Sahihs. Meaning the ahadith that were left out by Bukhari and Muslim, and I think they should also be in Bukhari and Muslim. So this is the famous book of Al-Mustadrak, and uh, it's everybody, every scholar of hadith knows this book, Al-Mustadrak ala sahihain And uh, in this book, uh, volume 3, page 77, uh, sorry, page 76, the hadith goes as follows, that... Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrates that uh, on the day of the Saqifah, he, he tells the whole story that Abu Bakr was basically given the, uh, the, the, the bay'ah. And then I'll jump to the point uh, that ثُمَّ انطَلَقُوا فَلَمَّا قَعَدَ أَبُو بَكَرْ عَلَى الْمِنْبَرِ When they went back to the masjid from the Saqifah. When Abu Bakr sat on the minbar, نَظَرَ فِي وُجُوهِ الْقَوْمِ He looked at the people around him. فَلَمْ يَرَ عَلِيًّا He couldn't find Ali ibn Abi Talib. Okay, so according to this narration, 
he is paying attention who is there and Ali is not there. فَسَأَلَ عَنْهُ So he asked, where is he? فَقَامَ نَاسُ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ A group of Ansar stood up. فَأَتَوْ بِهِ And they went to call him and brought him. فَقَالَ أَبُو بَكَرْ And so the Prophet, uh, Abu Bakr said, sorry. Uh, فَقَالَ أَبُو بَكَرْ إِبْنُ عَمِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَخَتَنِهِ أردت, أردت تَشُقَّ عصا المسلمين. O cousin of the Prophet and O son-in-law, do you want to break the unity of the Muslims? So he's asking him, and this is on the member on Monday. He's asking him, do you want to break the unity of the Muslims? And Ali ibn Abi Talib says, قَالَ لَا تَثْرِيبَ يَا خَلِيفَةَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ فَبَايَعَهُ He said, there is no sin on you or I have no problems O Abu Bakr O Khalifa Rasulullah and he then gave him the bay'ah now this uh, hadith uh, it is said that it is narrated in the books of, of hadith that Imam Muslim the famous Imam Muslim heard of this hadith from his teacher Ibn Khuzayma another famous scholar of hadith and he went to his and Ibn Khuzayma was not just a teacher, he was also a friend and a student. They were contemporaries. Ibn Khuzayma and Muslim were contemporaries. But Ibn Khuzayma lived a very long life. And Ibn Khuzayma died in 311 Hijrah. Whereas Imam Muslim died in 261 Hijrah. And Al-Hakim dies 405. So Hakim is a whole different generation. Okay, 405. Uh, Ibn Khuzayma is 311. And Muslim Ibn Hajjaj is 261. Okay, so this is a previous generation, 100 years ago. 100 years ago. And as I said, Ibn Khuzayma and Muslim were contemporaries, except that Ibn Khuzayma lived a much longer life, and so he dies 311 Hijra. Okay, but they were contemporaries, and they were students and teachers together, i.e. they narrated hadith to each other, and they benefited from each other. Okay, so Ibn Khuzayma, Imam Muslim, goes to Ibn Khuzayma. And Ibn Khuzayma, by the way, also has a book called Sahih. So Bukhari has Sahih, Muslim has Sahih, Ibn Khuzayma has Sahih, and then there's one more, Ibn Hibban has a Sahih, there's four Sahihs uh, today. Today you went into a little bit of Mustalah books, okay? This is all bringing back my own memories, this is what I graduated in from uh, my college days, right? My Hadith uh, degree. Uh, but the point being that Imam Muslim went to Ibn Khuzayma and said, have you heard this, do you have this Hadith? I have heard you have it. So Ibn Khuzayma wrote this Hadith for him. The same hadith, Ibn Khuzayma has the isnad. And this isnad goes back to Ibn Khuzayma. So this hadith goes back to Ibn Khuzayma. He wrote him and he gave it to Imam Muslim. Imam Muslim looked at the isnad. So Imam Muslim is the master of isnads. And he said, this hadith is worth a whole camel. It's an expression. Like a lot of money. A whole camel. Now, of course, why is this hadith so precious? Because it mentions Abu Bakr's bay'ah, Ali's bay'ah to Abu Bakr on the day of the death of the Prophet Okay, so Ibn Khuzayma said, no, it's not worth a camel. It's worth, and then he used a word that rhymes with the badana, uh, and they basically means a treasure, which is like a million dollars, we would say. It's not worth an animal, it's worth a fortune, we would say. So Ibn Khuzayma and Imam Muslim both considered this hadith to be authentic. Imam al-Zahabi uh, and al-Hakim also, and Ibn Kathir, they all consider this isnad to be authentic. Okay, so from our perspective, this isnad is authentic and it clearly illustrates that Abu Bakr asked for, um, uh, for Ali ibn Abi Talib and he noticed that Ali was not in the audience and therefore he called for Ali uh, to come and Ali came and gave the, uh, the oath of allegiance. Now, but there are also evidences in our own books that for the first six months the oath was not given. So this is not something that we have to be fair here. It's not something that we can say, oh, those guys invented it. No, there are references even in our own books. How do we reconcile? I'll talk about that in a while. Uh, but uh, of the evidences, now we get to actual Sahih Muslim. This is actually Sahih Muslim. Uh, and in Sahih Muslim, uh, in Sahih Muslim, volume 11, page 299 in my uh, edition, So we have the hadith here, uh, and I'm going to get to this uh, issue, uh, I was hoping today, but it's not going to happen today, the issue of Fadak, and the issue of the garden of Fadak and Khaybar, and all of this, I wanted to do that today because it's kind of linked to this, 
uh, but I'm going to have to delay the Fadak issue till next Wednesday. So let's finish the issue of uh, the issue of uh, the Bay'ah uh, today. Uh, so this Hadith is in Sahih Muslim, so we know it's authentic, completely. We don't have to worry about Isnads, and it is in the book of Jihad, and. Regarding the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, we do not leave inheritance, all that we leave is charity. This is the hadith, okay? And it is because of this hadith, Abu Bakr did not give fadak to Fatima radiallahu anha. We'll talk about that next, uh, next Wednesday. So Aisha narrates that Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, sent someone to Abu Bakr asking her about her inheritance. Uh, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the fa Fay and Fay is booty that was won without war. There is no English term as far as I know. I don't know of any English term for this. The Fay is what the enemy gives you without war. And Fay has different rulings than Ghanima. And the Fay to the Prophet Sallallahu has a special ruling. Because Allah clearly says in the Quran, Mimma afa Allahu ala rasulihi. So it's a very clear ruling for the fate of the Prophet is specific. And so Fatima wanted her part of the fate. And we talked about the fate when we talked about Khaybar and the neighboring cities of Fadak. Before the Muslim army came, they simply, without an army coming, they offered to the Prophet and they said, Take 50% of our produce uh, and let us be where we are. So this is fight. No army has come. And 50% of Fadak is a fortune. It's a huge amount of money. And uh, Fatima radiallahu anha asked about the inheritance. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Prophets do not leave inheritance. Whatever we leave becomes sadaqah. And the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa will eat from the money of the treasury, meaning, I will take care of you. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is saying, the treasury will take care of you. But the FedEx uh, entire land belongs to the treasury. Not to him, not, it belongs to the uh, treasury. And I will not change uh, anything as the Prophet ﷺ, uh, did it. So, uh, Aisha says, فَأَبَى أَبُوْ بَكْرٍ أَنْ يَدْفَعْ إِلَى فَاطِمَةَ شَيْئًا Abu Bakr refused to give Anything to Fatima, فَوَجَدَتْ فَاطِمَةُ to Ala Abi Bakrin fi ذَلِكْ So Fatima felt something towards Abu Bakr because of this. Some minor things. It is human nature. فَهَجَرَتْهُ فَلَمْ تُكَلِّمْهُ حَتَّى تُوفِيَتْ So she did not speak to him until she passed away. She did not speak to him until she passed away. Now pause here. This is Aisha narrating. Remember. And we know, now Aisha is narrating from her knowledge. We know from uh, another hadith, and perhaps Aisha did not know of this, that when Fatima fell sick, Abu Bakr went to Ali's house and asked permission to visit Fatima. So Ali went to Fatima as she's lying on her deathbed and saying, Abu Bakr is at the door, he's asking permission to come and speak with you. Can I give him permission? And so Fatima says, yes, give him permission. And so he comes in and he speaks to her. And the narrator says, and he continued to placate her. I, you know, speak to her in a good way uh, until finally she became content with him. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq on Fatima's deathbed, he made up with Fatima. He kind of just went, oh, whatever happened in the past happened, let's move on now. So from our perspective, Perhaps some things might have happened, but before Fatima passed away, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq made it up. Aisha perhaps did not know this. So Aisha is saying, فَهَجَرَتُ She did not speak to Abu Bakr until she uh, passed away, and she only lived for uh, six months. Uh, and then when uh, she passed away, Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, buried her at night and did not inform Abu Bakr, and only Ali and a group of people uh, prayed over her. And then Aisha says, and Ali radiallahu anhu had respect amongst the people while Fatima was alive. But when Fatima was alive, he felt that the people did not give him the same, when Fatima passed away, he felt that the people did not give him the same amount of respect. And he decided to make up with Abu Bakr and to give the bay'ah to him. Now this version says, 
وَلَمْ يَكُنْ بَعَيَعَ تِلْكَ الْأَشْهُرُ And he had not given the bay'ah for those months. Okay, so what I'm trying to say, because you have known me, inshallah, to be a fair person, I'm not the type that is sectarian biased. What I'm trying to say, this version of events that Ali did not give bay'ah is also found in our books. And I just found, quoted you two books. Frankly, Sahih Muslim is more authentic. But when I quote you, I'm quoting you the memory of a person, no matter how great her memory, she might not know everything. And there are many examples of the Sahaba saying something and maybe they had, didn't have all of the details. right? Obviously, none of the Sahaba lie. This is something we unanimously agree upon. But Sahaba have memories like everybody else. And there are minor variations here and there. So perhaps Aisha did not know or perhaps there are other interpretations. Uh, so, فَأَرْسَلَ إِلَىٰ أَبِي بَكْرٍ أَنِ اِتِنَا So Ali sent to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, come and see us and make sure nobody else comes with you uh, fearful that Umar might come. Now this is again from Aisha. We do not know what is Ali's intention, right? And this is another awkward thing that uh, Ali radiallahu anha, anhu and Aisha radiallahu anha, there was some minor tension between them. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. This is the reality of human beings. The, some minor issues took place and of course this led to uh, the battles later on but there was always some issues and we even see this in the seerah that they're not everybody's getting along and this is the reality of human beings that even in a number of times in the seerah we have certain hints here and there but there's nothing wrong with this human beings are human beings the point is they kept their disagreements civil and what happened in the battle of uh, the Jamal happened without the intentions of either to have that bloodshed. Uh, but the point being, this is not the battle of the Jamal, this is, and we're not gonna do the battle of the Jamal at all. That's definitely out of the question. But uh, we're doing right now the, and you understand why already. You understand why. All of these things coming up, it's really not the best interest. Nonetheless, just some points here. So, uh, Umar said to Abu Bakr, that, oh Abu Bakr, do not go to them alone. And Abu Bakr said, and what do you think they're going to do to me? For I will, inshallah, go to them all by myself. Now, it's not as if Umar is fearful there's physical harm to Abu Bakr, but perhaps he's worried that they might convince Abu Bakr's mind to do something that uh, he doesn't want them to do. And so Abu Bakr visited, who is he visiting now? Ali and the Banu Hashim. He's visiting the Ali radiallahu an and the Banu Hashim. Okay? And he visited them alone. And, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. فَتَشَهَّدَ Ali ibn Abi Talib Abu Ta Ali ibn Abi Talib began by praising Allah, giving a lecture, a sermon, and then he said, "Inna qad arafna ya Abu Bakr fadilataka, wa ma a'taq Allah, wa ma wa lam nafas alayka khairan saqah Allahu ilayk." Oh, Abu Bakr, we know your blessing, we know your fadila, and we know that Allah has given it to you, and we are not depriving or denying or competing with you in any blessing that Allah has given you. But we feel that you have taken over this matter from us. So maybe, Ali radiallahu anhu, maybe felt that he has some more right. Maybe he did. And he's telling Abu Bakr, we feel this way. So he's being open and honest with him. That maybe you were hasty, maybe you went too quickly, I wasn't in the saqifa. So there is some some minor things going on, and he's being honest with uh, Abu Bakr as Siddiq. وَكُنَّا نَحْنُ نَرَى لَنَا حَقًّا لِقَرَابَتِنَا مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ And we felt that we have some right because of our closeness to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So this hadith is in our tradition. It is in Sahih Muslim. And it clearly demonstrates that Ali رضي الله عنه is speaking frankly to Abu Bakr. And what's healthy is it's frank. It's healthy. This is not any conspiracy going on here. He's telling Abu Bakr Siddiq point blank, I feel as if you were hasty. I feel you might have taken something that maybe this thing, maybe Allah had meant it for us. You are great in many ways and Allah has given you fadila. But maybe this one, maybe we might have had it. He's saying, maybe. So, فَلَمْ يَزَلْ يُكَلِّمْ أَبَا بَكْرٍ حَتَّى فَاضَتْ عَيْنَا أَبِي بَكْرٍ he continued to speak to Abu Bakr until Abu Bakr began to cry. 
Subhanallah, what a beautiful hadith here, right? Ali ibn Abi Talib is now speaking in this manner all way until Abu Bakr begins to uh, cry. Then it was Abu Bakr's turn. فَلَمَّا تَكَلَّمَ أَبُو بَكْرٍ Then Abu Bakr spoke. قَالَ وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَقَرَابَةُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ أَنْ أَصِلَ مِنْ قَرَابَتِي The relatives and the family of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم It is more beloved to me that I treat them nicely than I treat my own family. SubhanAllah, this is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. He is swearing by Allah. I would rather treat the family of the Prophet ﷺ better than my own family. And this is why I said in my also Karbala lecture, we are the true Shia to Al Bayt. Because this is what the supporters of the Al Bayt are. لَقَرَابَةُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ قَرَابَتِي I love the family of the Prophet ﷺ more than I love my own family. This is Abu Bakr speaking, right? I mean, this is amazing. And he is speaking it to the family of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, and then he says, as for this matter that happened between us of money, so the issue of money is the Fadak issue. And we'll delay that till next Wednesday. But the Fadak issue was painful. Because it is human nature again, especially when you're dealing with the quantity that you're dealing with. So he said, I did not do anything other than try my best to follow the truth. Meaning I'm not having any negative, I'm not being jealous or greedy about this. I want to follow the truth and I did nothing other than what I thought the Prophet wasallam would want us to do. And he went on and on until finally he basically convinced Ali radiallahu an and so فَقَالَ عَلِيٌّ لِأَبِي بَكْرٍ So Ali said to Abu Bakr مَوْعِدُكَ الْعَشِيَّةَ لِلْبَيْعَةَ Tomorrow evening I will give you the bay'ah in front of the people. Okay. فَلَمَّا صَلَّ أَبُو بَكْرٍ صَلَاةَ الظُّهْرِ Sorry, tomorrow afternoon. So when Abu Bakr prayed Salat al-Dhuhr رَقِيَ عَلَى الْمِنْبَرْ He and he stood up on the minbar. He uh, rose on the minbar. فَتَشَهَّدَ وَذَكَرَ شَأْنَ عَلِيٍ وَتَخَلُّفَهُ عَنِ الْبَيْعَةِ And he talked about the issue of Ali radiallahu an and the fact that he had not given the bay'ah. وَعُذْرَهُ بِالَّذِ اعْتَذَرَ إِلَيْهِ And he gave the excuses that Ali had also given him. ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرَ And then he sought refuge, meaning he finished the khutbah. So, Abu Bakr publicly acknowledged that Ali radiallahu an had some issues and we solved them. He publicly acknowledged this. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq rose on the member and he said, look, there were some issues and he gave some points and alhamdulillah they have been resolved. Then he came down. Now it's Ali's turn. So Ali then stood up, فَعَظَّمَ حَقَّ Abi Bakrin, And he magnified the rights of Abu Bakr. So he praised Abu Bakr. وَأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَحْمِلْهُ عَلَّى الَّذِي صَنَعَ نَفَاسَةً عَلَىٰ أَبِي بَكْرٍ وَلَا إِنْكَارَ لِلَّذِي فَضَّلَهُ اللَّهُ بِهِ And he did not do what he did, denying the superiority of Abu Bakr or denying the blessings that Allah had given him, but rather that he felt he had a share in it. In other words, Ali radiallahu anhu was saying that it was my opinion or my ijtihad that I thought I had a share in this. I'm not denying your blessings or your superiority. I'm not speaking about your positives that Allah has given you. But I had the impression or the notion that maybe this matter should have been mine and uh, maybe people were hasty, but now the matter has been resolved. So uh, Ali radiallahu anhu publicly acknowledged now that the minor dispute is over. Okay, so فَسُرَّ بِذَلِكَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ So all of the people were happy at that. وَقَالُوا أَصَبْتَ And they said to Ali, good job or great work, you have done the right thing. فَكَانَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ إِلَىٰ عَلِيٍّ قَرِيبًا حِينَ رَاجَعَ الْأَمْرَ الْمَعْرُوفِ And the Muslims all were close to Ali. They loved what Ali radiallahu anhu had done when, they, when he uh, basically gave the oath and came back to the ma'roof. So this, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. It is an amazing hadith that demonstrates so many things. From this perspective, Ali radiallahu anhu did not give the bay'ah for six months. And from the mustadrak of al-hakim, he did give it the first day. How do we reconcile? Allahu alam. There is no authoritative reconciliation. You either say that 
the Hakim's hadith somehow is not authentic And it is in the end of the day Not in the six books It is in Hakim's book And it is not in the six books Or you say that The first bay'ah uh, The people began to talk It was given basically in a quick manner And the people began to talk And maybe Ali radiallahu himself felt that It was done hastily And so he wanted to resolve that issue To give the second bay'ah and this is a possible reconciliation That the first bay'ah was done And everybody is emotionally distraught And the Prophet has just passed away It's not really done with contemplation, with thinking And people began to talk And issues began to arise So Ali radiallahu anhu visits Sorry, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu Visits Ali radiallahu anhu And solves the issue And this is again an amazing thing That there's nothing wrong with this That there were some minor disagreements Over a major issue That's the khilafah But what is important is that all of these narratives converge on one reality And that is that Ali radiallahu anhu Then accepted And he went on with it And the same went for the Khilafah of Umar The Khilafah of Uthman as you know And then his turn came for the Khilafah And uh, he was the appropriate person for the Khalifa at that time uh, So the point being this is uh, With regards to the issue of Ali uh, when did he give the bay'ah? And the bottom line is perhaps the joint narrative, and this is what Ibn Kathir kind of supports, is that there was an initial quick bay'ah, and then that bay'ah did not quite stop the slight tensions that were felt. And by the way, this also shows us, and I'm being honest here, that there were slight tensions from the very beginning. This gap that now exists in these two trends of Islam it does go back There's no denying this There are roots, there are seeds to this From the very beginning Now what has come now is not what used to be These seeds are very, very, very minor Right now And we see it in these narrations But what's going to happen The branches that have continued to go Have gone very far from where the seed landed Or where the seed initially came And there is nothing at all that is worthy of criticizing in any of these narrations It's all legitimate, it is all completely human And it's something that demonstrates that yes, there were some minor issues But they resolved them, they got over them And in the end, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was acknowledged by Ali And is very explicit in the Sahih Muslim narration That he acknowledged the fadl that, that Allah has given to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq And then basically, he said, I thought something And then basically they moved on and the issue was indeed resolved Inshallah next Wednesday We will do uh, the other controversial issue And that is the issue of Fadak and Khaybar uh, And I'll just try to go over it again uh, In a manner that is Not as quick as I'd like to But still not as detailed as others go into There is no easy way out, right? You really can't get into it But any quick questions about this issue, Inshallah? Because I know this is very... Yes? None of these two narratives are found in the They say that Abu Bakr forced Ali after six months Forced by threat of death So he forced him Everybody acknowledges he gave bay'ah after six months Both sides acknowledge this From our book it's very clear Sahih Muslim It's very clear Ali and Abu Bakr had an intellectual discussion And Ali radiallahu anhu was convinced In fact Far from being forced Umar ibn Khattab said you shouldn't go alone They might convince you you should go with people Not with astaghfirullah guns But with a group to defend your position And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says What do you think they're going to do to me? And he's not worried about being convinced He's not a young kid He's not going to, what are they going to do to me? And he walks in alone And there's the entire Banu Hashim All of the Banu Hashim are there And again this shows And again I'm the type of guy I don't like Sectarianism, especially when it's lying against each other I like to be honest And honesty tells us There were slight roots of this from the very beginning And there's nothing wrong with it That's the whole point We need to be mature enough to understand So what if some of the Banu Hashim felt that Maybe they were more worthy of it The point is 
they didn't cause any issue, civil war. They, did, they followed Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and they were good companions and they upheld the Khilafah and they fought alongside Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. And uh, in, the, in the incident of Uthman, by the way, uh, um, Ali sent Hassan and Hussein as bodyguards for Uthman. I mean, look at this narrative, right? As bodyguards for Uthman ibn Affan. He's sending his own sons armed to, to defend Uthman ibn Affan. This is our narrative. So we have to put these things in light of everything else, right? So what? They're human beings. Who amongst us doesn't have issues with his own blood brother? You tell me. With his own sister. With your own parents. It happens. But life goes on. And you get along. And this is what our narrative is. Okay? Ali radiallahu anhu had an opinion. Maybe I am worthy of it. Maybe I should deserve it. And he realized, well, I'm worthy of it when I'm worthy, which is the fourth khilafah. So it's nothing wrong with this. It's not, nobody is saying, astaghfirullah, he had evil intentions. We all say, if he wanted it, he wanted it for the benefit of the ummah. He felt he has rights because he is the son-in-law, he is the cousin of the Prophet He felt he has rights. So what's wrong with that? He felt it, that's his ishtihad. And the rest of the sahaba, did not agree with that ijtihad and they gave him the khilafah when they felt he had the right to be the khilafah. He was man enough, Muslim enough, Sahabi enough to accept it. Unfortunately, I would say those who follow him, to me, they don't have that courage and iman, obviously, that, that, my, that I say Ali had, radiallahu anhu. Because Ali radiallahu anhu, this is what you call the true leader. Even if he didn't agree, okay, there's an ummah, you have to take care of it, right? You're not going to have a civil war and fight Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. No, it's not worth it. Even if he felt it, he said, okay, khalas, bismillah, let's go. We have, a, we have an ummah to, solve, to take care of. And that's what he did, didn't he? Right. So this is really from our perspective, uh, the point, inshallah. Yes. None of them do. Okay, why is that? Because he's a biased historian from their perspective. Everybody's biased in the end of the day. In the end of the day, everybody's biased. There's nothing wrong with that as well. You know, there's no such thing as objectivity. We are biased, they're biased. We are biased for the Sahaba. It doesn't matter what you tell me, I will never, ever, ever look down at the Sahaba. End of story. They will call this a bias. I will interpret anything you throw at me so that the Sahaba are out of any impunity of their character. This is a bias. It's theology. Now, is this science? No. Is this rational? No, it's theology. It's Iman Bil Ghaib. Right? So from our perspective, we have our biases. From their perspective, they have their biases. So in the end of the day, here's the point. We're not going to solve the problem. We're going to continue to have two narratives. Some people of intelligence will look at both sides and, you know, we have, alhamdulillah, people a lot of times switching over. But in the end of the day, we are, I am a person who doesn't want to increase the flames I have, my position is very clear. These two trends exist. They have existed for quite literally 13 centuries. And no matter how much you talk about them, they're not gonna go away. So we need to deal with it in a civil manner. Civil manner. Let them be, let us be. Don't have physical fights, much less bloodshed between the two. Allah will be the judge. And these discussions that we have should be kept very civil, very academic. And I am not the type of most other people that are very emotional and sectarian. And as I said, even what you heard me say today, you will really not hear too many other people say. That's also one of the reasons I bought the books, because if I didn't bring, bring the books, honestly, people are going to be shocked. What Ali said, this well, it's here, Sahih Muslim. I'm not the one making it up. This is in our own traditions. You either negate Sahih Muslim or, so th this is why I actually bought the book as well. So that you, you see this notion of the Al al Bayt being in charge, it existed from early Islam. It's not something coming out of the blue from far right wing. This is something that is coming from within, from the Al al Bayt. So the movement that came from them exaggerated this claim. That's the whole point. It is here, but they took it to such an extreme that these very people whom they claim to follow will dissociate themselves from the views of the later groups. This is our perspective. The Shia only follows the Quran, they don't follow any other books. No, for the, for the Shia, they follow different groups of hadith, uh, different books of hadith, that for them, everything the Prophet said and the Imam said is hadith. 
So they define hadith to be statements of the Prophet and the statements of the Imams. So these books of hadith are completely irrelevant to them. They have their own books of hadith. Just like we have the Qutb al-Sitta, they have their books as well. And their most famous book is Usul al-Kafi of Al-Kulayni. This is their most famous book. It's like their Bukhari. It's literally like their Bukhari. Uh, Usul al-Kafi of Al-Kulayni. And they have other books. Um, SubhanAllah, I should know these names. I memorized them once upon a time. At Tafsir and others, uh, they have their standard books. Uh, uh, um. mm -hmm. No, no, no. That's, uh, and then they also have Nahj al-Balagha, which is... Uh, the famous collection of the statements of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But the point is for them, any statement of an Imam is equal in weight to any statement from the Prophet ﷺ. You see the point here, right? They don't have current day Imam, Twelvers. The Twelve Imams. And the Twelfth Imam doesn't have any statements. And primarily it's Ja'far al-Sadiq who has most of the statements. Okay? One question from the sister, go ahead. Then we have to break for Yarhamkumullah. What exactly is Fadak? Fadak is an area that is outside of Khaybar, that is sister to Khaybar. It's an area, city surrounded by plains or a, a, a garden grove surrounded like by lots of dates being produced there. So Fadak and Khaybar were two large date producing areas. And as for the issue of uh, Ahli Kitab, so um, that's a very long discussion and it is not clear from this, did he mean that say Bismillah over the any type of food given to you? Or is it the meat issue that when the meat is given, then say Bismillah? And also, and I've spoken about this and I've given papers about this a lot, that saying Bismillah while sacrificing an animal, uh, the majority of scholars say it is a necessary condition to make the animal halal. And Jews and Christians are and were required by their law to also say the name of Allah. And we know this because we have explicit references even in Christian literature. Uh, and as for Jewish literature, then to this day, uh, kosher uh, laws or the kashrut as it's called, it mentions the blessing before you sacrifice. So when the Yehud sacrifice an animal, they actually bless and they mention the name of Allah. And for us, that is the tasmiyah. And so the Christians are also obliged to do that. So if a practicing Jew, there are no more practicing Christians who follow the Sharia, because Pauline Christianity abrogated their Sharia. Paul's version of Christianity abrogated the Sharia. But for many hundreds of years, there were Christians who were Jews, who believed in Jesus. You understand this point? They were Christians who were Jews. They were Jews who believed in Jesus. And these Jews who believed in Jesus followed the laws of Judaism. And they did not break the Sabbath. And they circumcised. And they did not eat pork. And they sacrificed animals. These are the real Christians from our perspective, right? These are the real Christians. Those real Christians, examples of them are Salman al-Farsi and his teacher, right? Those real Christians followed the laws and a part of their law is to sacrifice in the name of God. So if you were to meet such people, their meat is halal for you. And if you are in doubt, when you meet such people, you may say Bismillah and eat. But when you know for a fact that Bismillah has not been said, then you saying it when it is presented to you does not substitute having been said at the time of Tabah. Okay? And that's the whole Zabiha issue which you had to bring into Abu Bakr's Khilafah. So, uh, no, you're not allowed to eat outside meat, inshallah. That's my position. But it's a fiqhi issue, no big deal, inshallah. Inshallah, with this we will continue on uh, next Wednesday, inshallah ta'ala. Bismillah. <laughs>